Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bleak Haven, hosted by me, the Birdman. And uh, today we got we got with us a pretty a pretty cool cat, Mister Mister Donald Ruse. He's the he's the Bleak Haven studio executive and writer. How's it going, Mister Ruse? Well, howdy there, Birdman. Pleasure to be here. I'm I'm glad you're here as well, man. <laughs> it's about time. I uh, I think after the the second installment, I was like, I'm probably going to be on this pretty soon. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> you're you're like you're like as soon as as soon as I saw those other guys get on there, I'm just like, come on, man. When's it going to be my turn? In case any of you kind folks at home were wondering, Mister Ruse is a proud husband, father, and Idahoan. Oh, and he's a story addict. A story addict, eh? <laughs> that's, that's right. Oh, really? You're clearly <laughs> addicted to stories. Let, let's hear about them. Well, oh, yeah. I, never, I wouldn't say I need to go to rehab or anything, but oh, uh, story, stories have definitely been a, uh, an important part of my life. Like, I don't know, just always. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, you know, you have, you have crazy aspirations. I wanted to be a Power Ranger, I think, when I was in second grade. You know, like that, like most kids. Of course. But uh, you, you really latch on to things as, as children, and I just never grew out of that. You know, you're like, you want to be a superhero. You want to be like a, a Digi-Destin from Digimon, and um, <laughs> I still do. And the problem is, is when you're an adult, you realize that those things aren't real. So the next best thing is... Uh, is to try to create those worlds that you're so obsessed with, you know? Yeah, try to create new storylines for the, the. I, I feel like uh, that that like that's the best part of like being a kid, though, is like that imagination of like watching Saturday morning cartoons, you know, and then uh, being able to go home and just recreate. I feel like most story addicts probably had action figures at one point in their lives. If they didn't. <laughs> They're not good story writers. Right. And I was lucky enough to grow up in the country. So I spent most of my time running around with a stick on like foreign worlds and stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. You were, you were bridged to Terabithian that stuff, man. That, that's absolutely right. Except no one died in, in my story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Wasn't that the most traumatic book that they made us read in elementary school? <laughs> oh, man. I don't know why they don't put that movie and the movie where they that kid gets killed by bees like in the, like a double as a double feature. Oh, what was you that? Know, My that girl? One. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. That that one was dark too. It was so like in the dairy aisle next to the chocolate ice cream. No kidding for two ninety nine. So, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Where do you come from? Born and raised in Idaho. Uh, I was raised in eastern Idaho. We're living in in central uh, west Idaho right now in the Boise area. So that's been fun. Uh, we're really lucky to live here in the, the Pacific Northwest. It's just a beautiful place. It's full of life and adventure. And, uh, you know, funny, funny you should bring that up because I think that living in the Pacific Northwest is going to be really important to at least right now where bleak haven comes from i know i know that bleak haven cade's story right now is located on the east coast but a lot of the stories that you'll see cropping up um we're going to be incorporating like uh the midwest the pacific northwest to kind of really branch out oh and, nice yeah it's so it's not just so so it's not just one-sided you don't just got the east coast avengers you got the west coast avengers too yeah, exactly but but that's that's but, the big thing is is most course. stories typically take place in in like east coast um new york west coast los angeles san francisco and so yeah. we wanted to really focus on the other giant portion of the country where <laughs> the woods we're going yeah. to go out to the back country. What yeah. have you? Uh, there's a there's a meme floating around the internet uh, of like Spider Man on a barn, and he like shoots his web, and it doesn't go anywhere, and then he falls off the barn. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's every kid growing up out here, you know. Like, you want to be Spider Man, 
but there's nothing to swing yeah, from. Yeah, what are you <laughs> going to swing from a tree? Yeah, that's fun. No, I feel that, man. That I feel that I feel that as a kid from Utah too. There's there's, there's just no we're not at a playland of buildings and you know, corporation. We're out here. Sure. But at the same time, there's so much to inspire the imagination. And uh, I don't of know, it's, it's a really magical place, especially um, where where I'm from originally in Idaho. Like we've got the Snake River, we've got a lot of waterfalls and there's just um, so much to to tickle the imagination. Oh, are you telling me like every 10 miles, you just, you're just driving up, waterfall, waterfall. <laughs> Exactly like, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing piques my imagination yeah. like Niagara Falls. <laughs> They're just littered, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Now that you've told us a little bit where you're from, um, describe a little bit more about your role for or for Bleak Haven. Like, what 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 are you doing more specific for Bleak Haven? Oh well, it depends on who you talk to, really. Um, oh. I think I think the uh, the official title I've been given by. Um, Kate and Cassie is lead pessimist. Oh, t- t- it's all right, man. <laughs> I'm I'm just called the the podcast guy. That that's my yeah. title is podcast guy. So, so uh, Kate Kate originally brought me in as, as a writer, and and when they're first getting this off the ground, I kind of offered to help with the social media stuff. And of then uh, as as this has been growing, I've kind of taken something of an administrative role, and I've I've kind of worked with Kate and Cassie on on some of the the bigger decisions, and and as things roll out, we'll we'll take care of the the less fun aspects too. I think that's where the studio executive comes in because I'm going to help them on the the non fun creative part of Bleak Cabin. <laughs> oh, nice! So, hey, yeah. hey, someone's got to deal with it though, you know? <laughs> right. So it's funny. Uh, it's, Kate and I have been friends for, for years. And uh, he he started going to film school, I think, I think 2013, 2014. And we, I, I went to South America for a couple of years. That, that's a fun story in and of itself. Uh, but when I got back, uh, he was, he was getting close to where he wanted to be in film school. And, uh, and he started talking about opening up his own film studio. Oh yeah. And, at that point, I was, I was kind of deciding whether I wanted to go into children's programming, like uh, television, or um, education. And so I, I eventually landed on studying education because when you have that field of expertise, you can do a lot of things. Like uh, something that I had considered doing was um, becoming a you know, so someone who who aids and helps with uh, writing children's uh, material, yeah, like a tutor. And, no, so uh, oh, man, I just had the biggest brain fart, bird man. She's so giving uh, me plenty over here. I know. Uh, <laughs> My brain's on overdrive. What's the word? So, like, when you're work- working on a movie, you have like scientists and um, people who. Who help out? What are those guys called? Um, uh, producers, assistants. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm fixing to go no down worries. the line. It, it, it'll I don't come even back know. to us later. Anyway, but uh, but I wanted to help with uh, with writing children's educational programming. And yeah. and so when go, going back to the whole Cade and I situation, uh, Cade would always tell me that when he had his own studio, that he'd bring me in. To help out with the the children's portion of it to, to create uh, children's entertainment, and so when when he decided to get a start in the comic book world, he called me up about April, and he's like, "Hey, I'm making a comic." First of all, uh, I, I was in in college at the time, and w- when when you're in this state of life, I call it like the the dreamer phase. Yeah. Everyone thinks that they're going to touch the moon, you know, so I'm around yeah. business people who, who talk about how they're going to own Ferraris and have mansions in 10 years on their, yeah. their multi-level marketing schemes. And, and then in uh, t- four years, you find out they just drive a Honda Civic and they work at a grocery store. Exactly. Which there's no shame in that. But, no, not at all. <laughs> but, 
when you're in college. Maybe, everyone, maybe, everyone... maybe driving the Honda Civic. Maybe there's a little shame in that. Hey, but not, not the grocery store. I, I had a Honda Civic not eight months ago, and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so getting back to, uh, to what we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. so, so Kate told me he was going to write a comic book. You know, everyone says that they're going to do things. And then people hardly ever do, especially artists. I don't know how much experience you have. Um, not to throw shade, uh, but but I'm actually I'm married to to an artist. My wife is a as a studio artist. Uh, she specializes in wildlife. Oh, and shout uh, out, yeah. <laughs> and the hardest thing is is just to do it. You know, like anybody can do art, but very few people do because you actually have to put in the effort to to get it done. And so. Kate, Kate comes up to me. He had this awesome story that he told me about a couple months earlier. Because funny enough, when uh, when Cade started dating his now wife, um, she was really into Dungeons and Dragons. And so Cade, being the creative mind storyteller that he that he is, he wanted to throw all of the uh, <laughs> the already made Dungeons and Dragons stuff out the window, and he wanted to make his own world, his own characters. And, and he did. And he, he came, I think he, he talked about this in, in the first episode of your podcast, but he came upon like this, this idea. And from that idea, this whole world, this whole story kind of sprouted out. And, uh, and he told me about it. And I was one of the first people to know the whole story. And when you've got gold, you've got gold. So he's like, Donald, do you know that story I was talking about? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I, he he was writing a script for for the pilot for for a cartoon series and anybody who knows anything about animation you could fund several villages in africa for the budget of a of a cartoon <laughs> for, through a, through an, yeah exactly through an animation right but the wonder, and... wonderful thing about uh comic books is it's it's not cheap but as stories go whether you're talking about film animation or otherwise it, it's a fairly inexpensive way to get your stories out into the world and so that's kind of sure. why he latched onto that and uh so he's like not only am i going to make a uh a comic book but i'm going to make a whole comic book studio and i'm like good for you man that's awesome i'll be here for anything you need me to do he's like i want you to write a children's comic book <laughs> and I was really taken aback and you're just, because you're just, you're just like, come on, man! <laughs> <laughs> like, like for real? Like, uh, we we've got a lot of friends. We we've got one friend. Uh, so, so Kate and Cassie is a, have a close friend who's a published author. Um, we have another friend who who graduated with a degree in English, and uh, and I'm like, I mean, there's a lot of people you could turn to, and Cade's just really flattering. He just. Uh, described what, what what's what's kind of cool and a, a little little bit of behind the scenes of behind the scenes that that author which i think you're talking about you're talking about uh cassandra trussell right yeah yeah that's cool. yeah yeah little 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 known fact me her and uh, K- uh cassie uh Cade's wife all went to the high, same high school together me me oh, and cassie nice. were me, me and Cassie were in the same this? grade. That's how I. That's how I got thrown into the mix, man. Like I was, I was just friends with Cassie, you know, like just casual friends. I, and all through high school, I was a closet nerd. <laughs> you grow if you would have grown up where I grew up and and tried to be nerdy, you probably would have got thrown down the stairwell or something. But you know, it's uh, no, I that, get that it. That was also the that was also the cool the, the coolest part. But yeah, there's a there's a little bit of behind the scenes right there for for people. Yeah, that's that's how I well, I came to. That's interesting. Those you guys. should mention that because. Because like when when I was a senior in high school, I was a senior in high school in 2012, and uh, nice. back then it it wasn't popular to be part of this nerd culture. And no, I remember um, Avengers came out spring of my senior year, and it's a really embarrassing story. But I bought like this Avengers T-shirt at Walmart, T-shirt. and I went into the place where where we always spent time. Kate and I were in the same group of friends, very very tight knit group. 
uh, we're, we're still in contact. It's great. Anyway, so we, we bust into this room uh, where, where everybody hangs out. There's a symbol, which is dumb, but I was so excited for this meeting. Of course. And guys just, shut up. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. That's how I felt. That's how I felt going to high school. That's how I just felt going to school, period. I grew up in, like, small town America, you know, like, 20, I think there were 30 people in my class all together. And, yeah, like, all of them were, like, farmer, farmer types. You go out there and be like, oh, did you guys see the dark night? And they're just like, yeah, it was good. No, for but, sure. And I remember no. being at work in high school, and I was like, "I'm going to see Avengers tonight." And they're like, "Oh yeah, Batman's in that, right?" This is this is where the world was eight years ago. It's you know, true. like uh, nerd culture, superheroes, comic books. In the last nine to ten years, it's just taken over everything. I remember Kate Boswick, the creator of Bleak Haven. He he's the one who got me into Doctor Who. And at the time we got into Doctor Who, no one cared about it. Yeah. Matt Smith was just starting out, and it was like starting to to get hold in the United States. But I, I remember looking up like posters or um, j- just things you could buy, and there was nothing. Like everything was really like dumb British stuff. <laughs> yeah. No hate on the British, but I, but we're we're better at merchandising than, yeah, for sure. than across oh, yeah. the pond. That's a, <laughs> that that's clear. Yeah, that's cut and dry, but. But anyway, um, now it's everywhere. They're, like everybody's got a bumper sticker of of Star Wars or Marvel. Yeah, or of DC. The, I I can yeah, like ten years ago, I I in the on the back of my truck, man. I got the Empire sticker from Star Wars just chilling on my back window. And like ten years ago, I would have got reamed for it. You know, people would have been like, "That's nerd." I feel like go back, go back, go back to go back to getting cheated watching the NFL. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> no, absolutely, and and I think that where the world is now is is a great opportunity for for any creative uh, writers, artists. Have Have you been? So it's not Salt Lake City Comic Con anymore, but ha- have you been to? Uh, I think they call it Fanex now in Salt Lake. Oh. Oh man, I've been to FanX like five times now. All right, perfect. So my favorite yes. part, I've I've been there twice. So K Boston actually took took me for the first time. Amazing. Anyway, uh, there's a really embarrassing YouTube on uh, sorry, there's a really embarrassing video on YouTube where sure. we found everyone in uh, in FanX that was cosplaying, and we had a dance party. It's fantastic. Anyway, nice. Yeah, but before we we got into this, Kate and I actually attempted to uh, to start a, a viral YouTube channel. I think we got up to thirty six viewers. We we're very proud of ourselves. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I enjoy your optimism. That's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, that's that's um, awesome. I is it, I can only speak from the same experience. <laughs> After I went to seriously, if I didn't go to. If I didn't go to Comic Con, my first Comic Con when I was sixteen, I wouldn't even have started doing podcasts. Wouldn't even have known about them. Oh, nice! So yeah, good. So, so it's got a special part in your heart. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Com- Comic Con's a big deal for for not only me but me and my brother. Yeah, but it's it's like our tradition. Um, my Anyways. favorite part is uh, in in I don't know how it is in, in San Diego or Emerald City or anything, but in the Comic Con in uh, Salt Lake, they have what's called the Artist Alley. And okay. it's literally, there's hundreds of artists. Uh, they could be um, l- legitimate uh, guild comic book artists or just r- randos who who paint Pokemon. Yeah. But it's just fan art as far as the eye can see. And people pay their bills this way. If, they... if you stop and really think about it, we have created the ability for artists to make a living <laughs> drawing, writing, and talking about the things that they love. And really, that's a really cool and beautiful thing. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a high capital for artists. And 
storytellers and movie makers now because i feel like everything just revolves around storytelling now we've just come we we, like over the past i want to say you know like eight like even six sixty years i would say 60 years the past 60 years the iconic stories that have been told through movies and comics and all of it you know and i'm 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 happy that people are more modern about it nowadays people don't shun comic books away well and that's a really interesting point like comic books really used to be demonized by parents and and a a really good example of that is george orwell have you have you read uh, 1985 by george orwell i have not okay so definitely what i would i would consider reading um that's the must read before you die however um oh you know what i'm thinking of a different dystopian i'm thinking of fahrenheit 451 have you read that one i have not okay so so the idea of fahrenheit 451 is like free thought has been eliminated and it's only like multimedia so so the main character of fahrenheit 451 for any of our listeners who haven't read it is uh you have a fireman but in the future, in this dystopian future, instead of putting out fires, firemen um, burn things. And typically what they're burning is books. So it's illegal to have books in, in this modern society. And in t- time they find one, they'll burn it. The only thing that they remotely have, and it's not George Orwell, by the way, if anyone gets angry that I made that, uh, <laughs> that connection. <laughs> so it's a... It's a I think it's Ray Bradbury. I can't remember the up top of my head. I think it's Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451. Anyway, but the only resemblance they have of books in this futuristic dystopian society where they, they hate free thought is comic books. Because they, they, and this is the same area where like television was new and people thought that like your brain was going to melt out your ears from watching too much television. And, um, the, the sensory visual forms of storytelling were very new. And as we know, anytime something new happens, people love to freak out about it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and really when this book was written, uh, comic books were very new. They were very um, counter culture <laughs> and people were, were really worried about them. And that goes back to like the early 1900s where people used comic books to uh, kind of produce smutty and <laughs> un- oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> un- oh, un- yeah. Uncouth stories for people to indulge yeah, exactly. in. Exactly. And so people, people looked at how comic books were being used poorly and not what they were able to accomplish. Which, which brought the comic book authority or what the co- the comic book code of the of authority or whatever it's called, right? And yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. Well, so yeah, what's it called? Yeah. yeah so Approved it, by the comic I, code I'm, authority, DDA yeah. or the CCEA. <laughs> but but um, comic books is is kind of I I don't think by any means it could replace written literature, but it it is a a different form of literature, of, of media that, that can accomplish a lot of different things. And I don't think that it, and, and I, it's definitely being more accepted now, but I don't think that it should be um, underappreciated by any. Oh, means. not at all. I mean, you read a comic book and you're not just reading it for the story. You're reading it to look at the, the artistry, you know, the, the little things in the backgrounds, you know, like I feel like that's the appeal that that's the appeal that comics had that books themselves didn't. Yeah. Everybody picked up a book to get a good story, but no one ever, no one could ever see what the story really looked like through a, through a writer's perspective or an artist's perspective. I feel like that's what really brought in the whole, the comics era. But 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 there's still there's still an element of imagination with comic books because it, it gives you parts, but there's so much your brain can still fill in. Like, um, yes, you know what the world looks like and what the uh, 
what, what the characters look like and how they're portrayed, which before you could only do when when they cast actors in movies. Yeah. But something really interesting is uh, even the the most successful and accomplished of artists, a lot of times they will use um, pure colors as, as background. You're you're still in this setting of, of a broader world, and uh, so like just today, uh, my wife and I went to Barnes and Noble and I got um, the complete first volume of, of Hellboy with uh, the first nice how many issues? Yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, Mike Manilia and uh, John Blyne are are incredible at making a very simplistic. Like a simplistic art uh, world on the page where there's not a lot of color, there's not a lot of detail, but there's enough to really let your mind wander in this world. And so in that way, um, comic books aren't necessarily doing all the work for you, and there's still that element of imagination that regular written word offers. For sure. Just to just to talk a little bit more about Bleak Heaven, like what 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 what, what can we give the people, you know that that gives them a little bit of a little bit of a taste. So right now we've got the the flagship series, Welcome to Bleak Haven, which really is the start of the series. It's just p- kind of to get us out there as as a company to kind of preview what our stories are like, and then. After that, um, Kate and Cassie want to start a Kickstarter so we can fund the rest of our projects. And, and these few books are just trying to get that interest out there. So we have Welcome to Bleak Haven, which will be an introductory to the characters. Um, then we will introduce the, the full story of Bleak Haven. But we've got several artists, some of which I mentioned earlier, that are working on uh, a vast array of, of works. We have... Um, so, so my, my book, I, I can't say too much until there's a big reveal in our Halloween event at the end of, uh, end of this month, Ooh. but and I know yeah. it's fa- fancy and I think it's a, it's, it's my book, um, Cassie Boswick and Cade Boswick's books that, that we're going to be announcing. My book is kind of, kind of a, a coming of age, young adult adventure that takes place in the Rocky Mountains. It's kind of a a survival story along with like supernatural and it, it's really a book about finding yourself and and really helping others. It's going to be great. F- finding yeah. yourself <laughs> and, and helping others. Which doesn't sound exciting, uh, but it's, I mean, it's going to it's, be... It sounds I like mean, the magic listen, school bus, listen, it's, to be honest. I was just about to say that. I know it sounds like a PBS. After it kind of does. Special. Hey, but PBS gave us a lot of great things. It gave us Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson, which I I love watching. So so what I'm describing are, are going to be underlying themes, but um, but really it's it's a war of um paranormal creatures. If that that makes you uh, any more excited. okay. Okay, yo, you're 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 reeling me in here, like paranormal creep. Like, are we talking like Loch Ness monster type of creatures, like mythical? Well, so, so, Sa- the Sam Squatch. Sam Squatch. Yeah. So, so that's actually something really interesting, uh, and I'll get back to to the books that we're <laughs> we're releasing here for soon, sure. But, uh, yeah, but. Something that is important to to Kate Bostic as creator and kind of director of all of this is uh, uh, American folklore, like um, whether it be cryptids or legends, is is relatively unexplored in in media. Yeah. Like we really revolve heavily on like Euro- European myths, like leprechauns, unicorns, dragons. And, and, and now something that's really popular is, is ja- Japanese folklore because of the popularity of, of manga and anime. No, of course. Because you've got the, the Koopas and, and so, some really awesome creatures. But the thing is, is there's so many like Native American legends and legends that have cropped up throughout the years in North America that are really unused. So something that your listeners and, and our readers are, are really going to see is 
is we're really going to, to latch on to a lot of these North American and I think a little bit of Central American legends and folklore and show them in a way that that you've never imagined. Which is great because I don't like, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of comic books out there that deal with creatures, but they only spotlight like specific creatures. They don't spotlight like they don't do a vast variety, which is what I'm I'm kind of hoping when I when I read these is I want I want to see the variety. I want to know more about these creatures. Uh, and are these creatures that are going to be in this like from real life, like kind of folklore or like TV shows? I don't I don't know how to explain. It. I don't know how, I don't know how to ask this question. No, I understand. Like so, so I I can't I can't speak for anyone else. I know that uh, all I can say is that there's going to be a a very heavy influence on on real historical mythology based in North oh, America. Great. That makes sense. Yes, yes. That that's so, that, so, so that was the answer to my question right there. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Oh. And we're we're definitely gonna gonna pull from uh, from things that, that people might not even be aware of. Because I okay, so in, in writing my book I've I've had to dive deep into like the cryptid community and cryptozoology. Do you know anything about that? Um, I know very little about it. I'm hoping to learn more as I read more Bleed Kit. Okay. And your book as and well. You definitely will. But let me, let me just give you a short summary. So, so the difference between like a, a cryptid and a paranormal uh, entity is so, so a cryptid is like a physical creature who potentially could exist in nature. The, the most famous example of this, especially around here, is Bigfoot, yeah. right? So people believe that there is one or a population of Bigfoot creatures in especially the, the Pacific Northwest, For right? Sure. The, the border of Canada, like this heavy wooded region. They, they don't believe necessarily that he's um, an alien or um, a ghost or anything. He's just like a physical hot-blooded creature. Okay. So, so that would be the difference between the, uh, a cryptid legend and another legend. Um, another good example is the White Lady. There's a lot of uh, stories about like a woman who was killed, like murdered on her wedding day, and 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 you can also separate that from like alien encounters. And um, however, uh, I, I think you'll you'll will find a, a good mix. I, I think in, in in my book we're we're more going to focus on on like North American cryptozoology. But you'll you'll see some legends and and some some American myths snuck in there for good measure. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We we you gotta you gotta sneak a little surprises in there, you know. Of course. Yeah. And and I think another thing I should mention is <laughs> some some roadblocks I've I've run into as I was creating the story is I would I would give a concept to Cade, and uh, a a lot of it is uh, Native American based. And he would explain that there, there are some taboos and some cultural sensitivity that would restrict us from, from using a specific creature or myth. And so we've had to alter those a little bit. But I think it'll, it'll be pretty obvious for anybody familiar with that specific mythology of, of what we're going. Well, that's for. good. That of course, because you want to you want to make an appeal to the to the you know, to the modern reader, you don't. You don't want it to scare them off, and I can understand that. Or, or, or be be insensitive. Yeah, to, yeah, to yeah exactly. Not, not, not to get like no, yeah. the, like no, no one wants to be insensitive towards another person's culture over, especially over just a storyline. Yeah, so it'll be good. It, it's going to be fun and exciting and um, great. Anyway, so so go, going back to the stories we're releasing. Um, I again, I I don't know how much information I can release, but. I know we've got one story that's kind of based in organized crime, and we've got another. Uh, and I'm so excited for Cade Box with new book. So his his new book is is still based out of Blake Haven. It's kind of a spinoff of one of one of the the leading characters. Yeah. Um, but it's it's like a supernatural thriller, like supernatural investigation, like 
ghosts and mon- monster hunting. And I, I think it's probably going to be one of our biggest hits in, in the Bleak Haven line. I'm so excited about it. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I only know of, about very little, you know, I, 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 to be honest, just because uh, I, I only know of what, what, what they've shown me and they've showed me quite a bit, but I, it's like, I like how it, there's organized crime. There's more to the world than just a sp- specific subject. And, and diversity is really what we're going for. And I think like once, once we get big enough that we can start paying more artists and, and writers, we're really going to branch out. We, I, I think Cade's goal really is to be like the next image or dark horse. Which would be great. I mean, uh, it is, I mean, you've seen how many great, great comic books have come out from dark horse and everything. And if, if, if we could get that for Bleak Haven, I mean, who knows? The opportunities are endless. We could get a, a whole crap ton of comics and it, who knows? We could, we could further down, into a movie plot it's something that Cade talks about a lot and and if you ever get in a conversation with him he'll bring this up a lot of the comic book companies like um image or dark horse the thing that they're missing is like the continuity that dc and marvel have now don't get me wrong that has a lot of a, a lot of pros because you can have like these individual stories you're not locked into a continuity yeah. network. However, um, there is a lack of continuity stories that isn't DC and Marvel. So what Cade's really trying to create is a, a cohesive world, a shared universe, as if it was consistent with Image Comic or Dark Horse or with the many other independents out there. Does oh, that make yeah. sense? Of course. So, so I think that's really his, his main goal. And as we're releasing these new books and storylines, we're going to really see that come to fruition. I'm anxious to see all the different characters that are involved. I'm anxious to read the storylines. At this point, I'm anxious to see a comic book. Break, give it to me. Come on. <laughs> I think I'm very, very soon. I think we're, uh, my money. we just, I don't know exactly what we're finishing up, but, uh, but I think any day now we're, we're going to pump in that sucker. That's out. right. We're, we're kind of in this sweet spot right now where uh, no one has any expectations, which is a really wonderful place to be, except for maybe you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the only one holding all of the expectations. I'm just, I'm knocking at the door. Where is it? <laughs> but, but as soon as we, we really launch this and we get everything going, um, it's going to be exciting to to see what we can do with it. I think as soon as people start gener- or people start reading these these books, you guys are going to have a, a rough time putting them out, <laughs> get getting more out cuz I I know I've talked to at least 5 people who have seen just the art of of this and they're just like take the mo- take my money, take it all. I want all of them. <laughs> I want the entire series and I don't blame them one bit. I would too. That's the wonderful thing about working with Cade. I mean, in in, in April when uh, when he launched when he proposed this to me, I, I was like right in the middle of a life transition. I was uh, I was leaving education to go into the private sector to make more money. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily my my dream job. I wasn't p- pursuing my my goals in life. I just wanted to make a nice paycheck so I could. Uh, provide for my yeah. family and so i uh i go to my wife and i'm like well, listen kate wants to get me involved in another project um should i do this and and i'll never forget uh i can't tell you exactly what she said because i've forgotten but to sum it up she basically said that kate is a horse worth backing and that his his ideas and his stories they're going to be something. And another thing about artists is <laughs> really there's two kinds of artists. There's artists who give up and there's artists that don't. And as long as you're the latter, you're going to make it in whatever industry you're pursuing. Because as, as I've helped my wife pursue her, her career in art, 
we've seen a lot of mediocre artists who are really <laughs> successful. And so it's a good bet that if you have a good idea and you have the passion and tenacity that the boss licks do, that you're going to get this off the ground. And I think that he has a heart, a passion, and a philosophy about story that people can really understand and get behind. And I think, I really think that that's going to create a huge following. And uh, and I'm on this horse until it dies. So uh, same up. here, man. I don't I don't care if I'm I'm getting dragged behind it. We're I, I'm on board. Let's let's make <laughs> let's let's make more comic books. Sounds like we're in a cult. It does. It, anything anything else you'd like to share with the mass? Just for everyone out there, uh, check out our website. Our website's finally up. It's uh, bleakhaven.com yes we know it's spelled like bleak heaven that was intentional yeah (laughs) and we hope we don't get too much flack about it see see i think it's just a matter of like interpretation like you go to uh, but if you went to like belgium or germany they would say it different they wouldn't call it bleak heaven they call it bleak haven exactly it's funny because when I when I showed my wife like the the poster that Kate and um, Josh Boswick made, um, she's like they misspelled the name. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it says Bleak Heaven, not Bleak Haven. And I called Kate up. I'm like, Kate, we got a big problem in your first poster. You misspelled <laughs> the name. He's like, no, it's supposed to be Bleak Heaven. I made that bed and I intended. To sleep. <laughs> And so far, he's been sleeping comfortably, ladies and gentlemen. But um, yeah, make sure you check us out. Make sure you head over to the website, thebleakhaven.com. Go to us on, on Facebook and Instagram. And make sure you check out the official Bleak Haven podcast on Instagram. Oh, and something I want to mention about the website Ooh. is uh, <laughs> the, the poster, the, the only poster they had for a while. Was of, of the main villain uh, sitting on a stool sensuously. Yeah, he like was. He was. Rob he was, he, was, he definitely <laughs> had some Rob Lowe vibes going on. Anyway, so uh, a personal request: they have the number one issue of Skullman on there. Like it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful cover. I was actually blown away. Something I want to mention: I don't know if I'll get in trouble for saying this, but in in the black and white version. Um, I think it was intended that cinders were rising up next to Scullivan. Okay. And and our very, very talented colorist turned that into stars in the background. Really? Which, which I want to add just absolutely accentuates the heart of this character. That, that he is something of a dark character, but there's so much hope and beauty within that is really going to make this character our, our leading man in Blake Haven. I'm so excited. So um, check that poster out. Remember that I'm the one who got it up there, and I hope everyone enjoys it. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, And if you go onto the website, you can get uh, like all of the merch. We got T-shirts. We got posters. Soon we'll have comics. It'll be great. And, and for any, anybody listening to this, I want them to know that we're not just money hungry. Like anytime they buy a poster or a t-shirt, it's directly funding more stories, more comics. We really want to get this out. We We want, we want more content to give you. We want all of it. We want to give you more stories, you know, more, more artists. We for sure need more artists. That's for dang shit. And if we can buy. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of nice to be able to go to the grocery store and actually buy food. Where could the folks at home visit some of your works? Yeah, just tell them to stay, stay tuned, tuned and uh, and they'll they'll be available. Uh, I, I got to be honest, most most of my works uh, have been projects with with Kate Boswick, and so um, <laughs> most of the stuff we've worked on together is, has been unfinished and unpublished. But if people are patient long enough, I'm sure um, it'll come into life. Patience. <laughs> no one believes in patience. Better get that done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, for sure. Uh, and just, just pay, just, just hop over on, on, on our social medias and stuff uh, to keep up on all of the artists. Cause 
we we post more more stuff about art like art, the artists and stuff too on there yeah and and get cassie Peterson on this thing i uh, i want to i want to hear what she has to say. she already has been <laughs> has she she was she was in the first one? she was in the oh, first goodness. episode Okay, we'll get we her got, back. We gotta get, get her back. We gotta Brandon. get her we back. More from her. I, you know what I personally think Kate should do? I think he should make a Bleak Haven D and D. I think Dude, they're working on. Could it. you imagine? I've never even played D and D, but I would play D and D if it had Bleak Haven and stuff in it. it it's funny. I uh, th- there were three things. There were like three lines I'd never cross. Um, because because I've never been a, an exceptionally popular kid, but uh, <laughs> when I was in school. Uh, comic books was a cro- was a line I was never gonna cross because it was too nerdy and it's gonna paint sure. hard on your back, right? Cross that hard, wonderful, wonderful line to cross. The second one was Magic: The Gathering, and uh, I bought a deck but I never used it, <laughs> so so I think uh-huh. I'm still okay on that end. And then the the third line was uh, was Dungeons and Dragons. Oh. The thing is, is, when I got to college. Everyone played Dungeons and Dragons, and it's probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. It's it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I just I like I I I discovered like I I'd always known about Dungeons and Dragons, but I never really did a deep dive on it till I had listened to the the Harmon Town podcast. I don't I don't know if you know who Dan Mm -hmm. Harmon is. Dan Harmon's the person who made Community and Rick and Morty and. Yeah, they they started doing D and D on Harmon Town, and after I after I listened and watched a, their Harmon Quest on Verb, I was just like, I gotta I gotta try this. This this has to be fun. It it's fantastic. Make sure, ladies and gentlemen. Wait, do you have anything? <laughs> I'm 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 already shouting. I'm, I'm I'm trying to push away everybody. I'm sorry. Uh, did. No, no worries. I, I think I think we're golden. Um, I hope I've made a good impression. I hope you'll have me on again. You can, you can come on any time, man. You can come on next week and come on next week. I don't care. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donald Ruse. If you want to find out more about my content, you, you can head over to the Birdman and Rooster Show and to the Critter Community. And uh, you can find me on, on Instagram and Facebook at uh, the Birdman and Birdman Robinson. I have been the Birdman. This has been the Bleak Heaven Podcast. We'll see you next time.